Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Kay, and this is Dark Tales from the Road. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to get started here quick, but I have another featured podcast for you guys for this week. They are called Technically a Conversation, and I am loving this one, guys. Their episodes are only about 30 minutes, so it's a nice quick listen, and their subjects are insane. They just came out with one on Monday that is about the cocaine bear. There's actually a movie coming out about it also. Um, One of theirs is called A Kick-Ass Story of a Hockey Player, John Scott, The Tows Hum, things like that. And I love this podcast. So definitely check them out. And here is a little introduction to them. Tired of the same old podcasts every week? When you're ready for something different, come give us a shot. Greetings, we're Technically a Conversation, a podcast for curious people by curious people. Every week, we take turns sharing a new topic, and the other host has no idea what the topic will be. Our topics are all over the place, from light and funny to dark and sometimes spooky. We've covered everything from true crime, historical events and people, pop culture icons, the supernatural and occult. I like that. And legends and folklore. My favorite. We're like the Dollar Tree stuff you should know. Except completely different. No matter what the topic is, we try to make the episodes funny. Yeah, you may not want to advertise that. Our jokes aren't very good. What are you talking about? My jokes are fantastic. (laughs) Hey, I get paid to laugh either way. Wait, you get paid? Check us out at technicallyaconversation.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Shout out to the 11 and a half people that listen to us on Google Podcasts. Wait, you said you were getting paid? Thank you guys so much for listening to that. Go ahead and check them out on social media and wherever you get your podcasts. So again, I'm going to just jump right in. We are heading to the state of Oregon. We've been on the East Coast a lot, so now we're going to really head to the other side. And we're going to be staying at the Hot Lake Hotel. Very weird name. I think uh, it's also called the Hot... Springs Hotel, Hot Lake Springs, something like that. But yeah, I was really interested in this one because it has been so many different things. It's insane. This Their history goes way back and it's a, um, it wasn't just a hotel. It was a lot of different things that could definitely cause a lot of paranormal. So this one is pretty cool. So let's go ahead and get started. If you're new here, I do history of the city and state first, and then I dive into the subject. I really enjoy learning history, and it's been pretty cool going through all of these states. So yeah, I'm on 30, 35th state, and uh, it's it's been really crazy, and I really enjoy researching. So If you are not a big history person and you're like, oh, I don't want to hear this, that's okay. I really don't care. But you can probably skip ahead and just listen to the subject if you'd like. I'm I'm up for anything, guys. So let's go to Oregon. I've never been there, but it's very close to me now that I live in Montana. Oregon came about with the exploration by the Spanish and French. This was around the 17th, 18th century, and it was mapped out by Lewis and Clark during their expedition for the Northwest Passage. Oregon, you know, it all strikes in our head, the Oregon Trail, playing the Oregon Trail in school. If you guys are old like me, that was the best game ever. I just had my birthday, so (sighs) getting old people. So a lot of us know about this. It is just pushed into us like crazy during history classes. So some of this will sound very familiar. There were in the Oregon area about 125 Native American groups. That is insane. But a lot of the groups, you know, they don't stay in one spot. During the summer, they go here. During the winter, they go here. So There were a lot, but they probably definitely had their own boundaries, I'm assuming. So, yes, French and Spanish are in the area, but nothing really comes of it until about 1787. 
the some merchants in Boston sent two ships to the Oregon country. So they had to go a far way. Um, and it was captained by a man named Robert Gray and John Kendrick. They went there. Then they went there a second time. And so when Gray entered the harbor, which now that harbor is actually named after Robert Gray, but it actually is in Washington, if that makes sense. And this was around 1790s. He went there and he sailed over the bar of the Columbia River and named his ship the Columbia. If you remember my previous episode about Cape Disappointment in Washington, the Cape is on Oregon and Washington. It's like in the middle. So a lot of that like the Columbia, the bar of the Columbia River, it's also covered in that. Um, it's episode 21, Cape Disappointment. Um, it's it's a cool one too because it's very different from what I usually do. Um, it's, you know, there's a lighthouse and, and there's just so much folklore and tragedy at this place too. So definitely check out episode 21 if you're really into the Pacific Northwest kind of thing. But if you have seen it um, or heard it, sorry, uh, you'll get a lot of kind of the same information. So they came with ships from Boston, but British companies, they were fur companies, they came by land. And their company was called the Hudson Bay Company. There was another one also called the Northwest Company. So they took off across the country to open their routes of trade to the Pacific. Americans are watching the British move west and take over, so Americans, you know, they weren't far behind. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, Lewis and Clark, they reached the mouth of the Columbia River in 1805. That area was a huge part of strengthening the U.S. claim on the region because, you know, you have Canada there too that's pushing down also. So if you've seen Titanic, <laughs> a man named John Jacob Astor, he is the head of the Pacific Fur Company. He came in, he came in to settle in Oregon as a European American settlement and started establishing different things in the city and trading posts. This was about in 1811. So then the other companies that we spoke about, like the Hudson Bay Company, they actually established Fort Vancouver. Well, Fort Vancouver is not in Canada. It's actually in Vancouver, Washington. The Hudson Bay Company in the Pacific Northwest Territory really dominated that region for over 20 years. A big deal. Around 1830, People are flocking, and, and we all know this from history, you know, and these people were coming from the Northeast, especially, and the Midwest, to come to the Pacific Northwest, and missionaries were a huge part of that. Methodist, um, a man named Jason Lee, he established the first permanent settlement in what is the Willamette River Valley, and What's really crazy is, you know, the all of these people traveled. You can still witness today wagon wheel ruts in like in the soil. Like uh, when I did my Wyoming episode on Polly Bartlett, episode 14, by the way, you can see a bunch there also just these massive ruts. And I it's so cool how they are preserved even with the weather that's happened over, you know, all of that time. So it's, it's really cool. I definitely think you guys go check them out if you're in the area. Those ruts were made um, in the 1840s. And so after that, that's when U.S. really claimed the rights to that region. They even went in front of Congress to claim those, the region. It was in, Oregon was admitted into the Union on February 14th of 1859, and it became the 33rd state. 
So backtracking just a little bit, before the Europeans and Americans decided to settle in that area, the area known as um, Grand Ronde Valley was a very important place for the Native American people. And like I said, you know, they move around like crazy um, between winter, summer, and harvest and all this, and, and also to hunt and fish and trade. But with all, t- all of these states that we look into, there's oh, the, the devastating conflicts with the Native Americans. So by like 1883, it was not going well. They were moving Native Americans to reservations. And that same year is when a railroad came in, really helping to link Oregon to the rest of the world, or not world, the country. And it had a huge impact on their economics, especially because they pushed out the Native Americans into reservations, making this area more available and trying to really make it more prosperous. Agriculture and forestry um, were huge there, and by like the 20th century, a lot of the people lived in rural er rural areas, Um, but after that, cities came up like crazy, and that's when industrial, industrialization and manufacturing expanded, and then by the 21st century, it all flipped. All of those people now lived in urban areas, and came out of the rural areas. Rural is the hardest word to say. Oh my gosh. Portland is Oregon's largest city and it's actually considered one of the top cities in the nation in terms of quality of life and it is known for being a top producer of wine. They have over 300 wineries in Portland and they're just continuing to see all this growth. You know, they were a huge part of people moving west, but a lot of your immigrants are coming there also. They want the different atmosphere, and it was really well known at that time that the the state had very clean air and clean water, their cities were smaller, very beautiful environment to be a part of, but by the 21st century, their Oregon's urban areas was not the same. There was traffic, pollution, and a lot of infrastructure needed to expand to find a place for all these people coming in. And so Oregon worked very hard to find solutions to all these problems. And a lot of that included environmental planning and new resources, um, less intensive forms of production. And that is what really diversified the economy in Oregon. So now they're a leading, they have a leading role in bio and high technology, manufacturing and aquaculture. Didn't look that up, but it sounds cool. And it's, Portland is still considered one of the most attractive cities because of the quality of life. Um, while other places like Eugene and Corvallis, they're more urban areas that have seen growth but not as big as like San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, and a lot of the other West Coast areas. So here's some interesting facts about Oregon. It was a huge area for beaver hats and coats. There was a massive demand for them and because of the unrelate, unregulated trapping, beavers were eliminated, almost, almost eliminated, sorry, by the 19th century. And so the state works very hard to properly manage the mammals, um, the beavers, to make sure that they can flourish again because they are known as the beaver state and have a picture of a beaver on its state flag. So you got to gotta save the beavers. Um, in 1843, this is when over 12,000 immigrants made the 2,000 mile trek from Independence, Missouri to the Oregon Territory. And it was heavy, heavy traffic until 1884. 
And the Oregon Trail was one of the most used routes of all the westward expansion that happened in the United States. Mount Hood is a dormant volcano that last erupted in 1865, and it's covered by 12 glaciers and um, is about 11 feet above sea level, 11,000 feet <laughs> above sea level, so it's the tallest in Oregon. I wonder if that one will ever erupt. It's probably a terrible thing to think about, but curiosity. Oregon is very much known for their production of hazelnuts. Over 99% of all hazelnuts are produced there. And it's a leading producer of Christmas trees. It has an output of more than 4.9 million trees. And that was from... Two, that was in 2009 when they measured that. And lastly is Oregon's Crater Lake. It was formed from an ancient volcano, which is pretty cool, and it is the deepest lake in the United States. Very cool. So now we're going to go to the city. So this Hot Lake Hotel is outside of this city but every time I like googled it the address said La Grande Oregon so this is a little bit about La Grande Oregon so the Oregon Trail passed through the Grande Grande Ronde Valley and La Grande was one of the first places to be settled by the immigrants because they were bound for Willamette Valley a man named Benjamin Brown, he was one of the first settlers there, and he was a huge part of the community and a very big business leader in the town. And so the town was actually known as Brownstown or Brownsville, but there was already a Brownsville in another county, so the post office required them to pick a new name. So then later on, it was established under the name La Grande, and then the city was officially incorporated in 1865. So La Grande was a phrase used by a Frenchman. His name was Charles Doss, D-A-U-S-E, Dosse? I don't know. And it is used to describe the area's scenic valleys, you know. And what's kind of crazy is before the post office came, the postmaster or whoever, he charged 50 cents a letter to carry the mail on horseback to and from the nearest post office, which was in Walla Walla, Washington. That's pretty crazy. Like, I know our stamps now are super expensive, but I remember when they were lower uh, like that, you know? So it's pretty crazy that back in the 1800s, he's charging that much. So in today's money, it would be almost $10 to send a letter. That kind of gives you the broad uh, idea of how much that actually was for them. The growth in La Grande, you know, it's on the Oregon Trail. It just boomed from like the 1860s to 1870s because of that region had gold mines and was huge in agriculture. In 1884, that's when the railroad came and it grew even more. So I don't have a ton of information on it, but I kept it kind of short also. So La Grande is um, Eastern Oregon University. It was formerly known as Eastern Oregon State College. And it was actually in, built in 1929. It was the Eastern Oregon Normal School, which was a teacher's college. But now it's Eastern Oregon University. And La Grande is also very much known for their sugar factory, where they process sugar beets into raw sugar. Um, in Colorado, we lived near a sugar beet factory. Not that close, but you can still, it smells pretty horrible. And then their high school mascot was the beet diggers. But yeah, beets into raw sugar. It it doesn't smell great. It really doesn't. It's kind of it's kind of sad when you think about it. Anyways, let's get to the Hot Lake Hotel. I always thought this was the weirdest sounding hotel. It just doesn't fit. Like it doesn't roll. I don't know. 
but it's also known as the Hot Lake Resort, and it's very much built to look colonial. It was built in 1864, and it got its name because of the thermal springs that are around were are around the buildings that were built on the property. And we've talked about other hot springs areas, you know, a lot of the activity can really contribute to the area around and the hot springs and all of the metals and stuff that are in it. So, um, you know, we've uh, gone over the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, episode 22. Um, that one was a big one. And then we also went to Brunswick Springs in Vermont, where it used to be a, a hotel spring resort um, but it kept getting burnt down and it became a huge lore in the area and especially with the Native Americans so definitely check those two out if you are liking um, the hot, whole hot springs thing. When it finally opened it was a luxury resort and a sanatorium uh, during you know the turn of the century and it would also advertise different medicinal attributes that came from the water the hot springs water, the mineral water, and it just drew people instantly. It was also known as the first commercial building in the world to utilize the ge geothermal energy of the hot like of the hot springs. At one point in 1934, it actually burned half of the hotel down. So rebuilding became a process and then at that time the rest of the building was actually starting to be used for different things. There it was a retirement home, an asylum, uh, and a nurse's training school during World War II. And then after that, once all those kind of closed down, things came and went. Different owners and then sadly in 1991 that's when it was completely abandoned. It was rebought. We'll get into more of that later on. But today it is a hot springs resort, a pub, and a theater. So the hot springs themselves, they make up what's called Hot Lake. And it actually rests at the foot of a very large bluff that was used by Native Americans before all of the settlement and colonization that occurred. And the lake's name was a Kesh Pa. I hope I said that correctly. Um, by Nez Perce. There's a lot out there. Speculation, maybe not. Hard to say that a lot of very early European settlers were the first to find this thermal hot springs. And it was actually fully documented by Washington Irving in his recording of Robert Stewart's explorations during the Astor expedition in 1812. And this is what Washington Irving said about his time there. Quote, emerging from the chain of blue mountains, they descended upon a vast plain, almost a dead level, 60 miles in circumference of excellent soil. In traversing this plain, they passed close to the skirt of the hills, a great pool of water, 300 yards in circumference, fed by a sulfur spring about 10 feet in diameter, boiling up in one corner. The place, was the place was much frequented by elk, which were found in considerable numbers in the adjacent mountains, and their horns, shed in the springtime, were strewed in every direction around the pond. End quote. So again, after the Oregon Trail expeditions, settlers came in like crazy, and it was first utilized as a cattle ranch. And it was purchased by a man named Tommy Atkins. So Atkins claimed that he was cured of very numerous ailments after he fell into the springs. So it's like he wasn't trying to go in, but he fell in. And it was in an article that was published in the Organon? Organian? Sure. In 1914, um, when it was talking about the hotel's history. The lakes, their springs bubble half a gallon 
half a million gallons of water each day, and the average temperature is about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 93 degrees Celsius. Very hot. You don't want to go in it. <laughs> That's why a lot of it is pushed into tubs and stuff that you'll see. 1864 to 1906. This was the initial construction that happened. 1864, a man named Samuel Fitzgerald Newhart, he was originally from California, he came to the Grande Ronde Valley and started this wooden structure on the lake. And he had it faced towards the bluff rather than outward toward the lake. I'm not sure why. And what's kind of crazy about it is it was like its own living city inside of it. Because in the in that first structure, he had, it was like a shopping mall. He had a post office, a blacksmith, a dance hall, a barber shop, a bathhouse, and tons of other businesses there. By 1884, when the Union Pacific Railroad came and uh, finished construction, it ran ne right near the hot lake. In 1903, they came in and demolished the original wooden structure. Because the new owners wanted to build a hotel with bathhouses to really utilize the spring water. And a man named Dr. Fee, Fi, Fee, Fi, Dr. Fi, became a part of the project uh, in 1904. Because, and, and he said uh, he wants a brick structure because he intends for part of it to be a hospital. 1907 to 1993, these are known, this area, this time is known as their heyday. So a man named John V. Benins, he came in, he, a, a world-renowned architect, and he was a huge part of the agriculture, of the design of the building, making it very reminiscent of colonial times. 1908 was when the brick wheel wing of the hotel was completed, and it was about 65,000 square feet. And it was more of a Georgian style U shape with a solar solarium. Sounds pretty cool. And again, it was um, heated by the ger geothermal waters. And so when it was all built and reopened, the hotel had 105 guest rooms, 60 bed surgical ward, a ballroom, a barber shop, a confectionery, a drugstore, a newsstand, reception rooms, laboratories, and a commissary. Like, this thing looks big. Yes, it looks very big, but just thinking about all of that, I'm like, how, where, where do they fit all of this, you know? The hospital, they made sure it was state of the art. Major, big time soaking tubs that were supplied by the lake water, and they actually had an operating room complete with an elevator, elevated observation deck. Plus, the dance hall could fit 1,500 people. So, huge! Like, it's huge! The hotel really became known as, quote, the town under one roof. Um, it was a very self-sufficient property, and like we said, all the businesses that it included in there, and it actually produced its own vegetables, dairy products, meats, and eggs. So that's, that's insane. This was very interesting. In 1910, you know, they're in their heyday, the hotel grossed $178,000. May not seem like a ton, but in today's money, it is five point five million dollars that's insane just in in 1910 that was their yearly revenue and because they used geothermal heating they saved about fifteen thousand dollars per year in their heating costs which fifteen thousand a year in 1910 into today's money is almost five hundred thousand dollars a year that's huge. Oh my gosh. So 1911, 1912, huge time because that's when the Central Railroad of Oregon was built. And it was um, from Richmond, Oregon, directly to the hotel. Huge. 
again, they're in their heyday and it just keeps going, getting bigger and bigger. So in 1917, we had talked about Dr. Fai already. He purchased the hotel and the resort and he renamed it the Hot Lake Sanatorium. But what transpired from that is the building was known only for the rich. Because, you know, the resort was for the rich, but the hospital for the ill, if that makes sense. It was very exclusive in two very different ways. And the mineral waters from the springs were actually used to experiment on patients and guests. And it said experiment. I don't know what experiments happened there, if it was a bad thing or very a little thing. I don't know. But it became a huge part of what Western experimental medicine was. By 1924, this place is a tourist attraction. People are coming worldwide. Um, It is said that the Mayo Brothers, who founded the Mayo Clinic, they came to the hotel a lot, or the sanatorium. Um, And also Wild Bill Hickok, he loved going there. So that area, it staffed 15 nurses, four physicians, an x-ray technician, a bacteriologist, and with all of that, it really got the nickname, quote, the Mayo Clinic of the West. So there was this advertisement in the Oregon Pacific Railroad that they promoted about the healing properties of the water, and this is what it stated. It said, quote, Hot Lake Hotel is the largest, hottest, and most curative springs known. Best bathing facilities, most courteous attendance, first-class medical and surgical conveniences, finest operating room in the West, steam heat, electric lights, hot and cold water throughout the building. And a lot of the other advertisements were like that, Um, you know, about drinking the water to to cure you. Um, Mud baths and poultice uh, from the lake sediment were also used as treatment there. So it's like a high-end spa that also has hospital whatever you think (laughs) this is where things went south 1934 to 1990 that's a huge time range um but a lot happened so dr fai he died in 1931 of pneumonia and he was the owner of the property at the time in 1934 a fire destroyed most of the building's west wing, just demolished the wood structures. And it was that whole 65,000 square foot portion. No, but the brick portion of the building survived the fire. So they still had 65,000 square feet left of the brick building. So prior to the building, they had so many rooms, so much dining, and thousands of guests could be there. But since the fire, the business at the hotel completely declined, just gone. And the hospital on the third floor was the only remaining business that was functioning at the time. Around World War II, we kind of spoke about this, a flight school and a nurse training center was established in the hotel. That was around 1939. In 1941, the property was bought by a man named A.J. Roth, and he turned it into a nursing home for the aged in 1951, and then later an asylum. You know how I love asylums. Come on, guys. So it ran as an asylum and a retirement home until 1974 when ownership changed again. It was a restaurant and a nightclub uh, at one point, and is short-lived but it was very successful as it's changing owner changing ownership as it's changing businesses this is when things really ramped up about rumors of the hauntings that were plaguing the building and that really started in the 1970s in the 1980s a man named dr lyle griffith he purchased the the property and he still had the bathhouse going. He had um, a corner of the property that he used as a bathhouse. 
Um, but it only lasted until about 1991 and then it closed down. And that's when it was fully abandoned. Just fell to the vandals, fell to the elements. Um, it was in a very rough spot. So it actually sat abandoned for 15 years, even though it had been purchased by um, a company in Seattle, BBR Holdings Cor Corporation. So it's sitting there abandoned. Haunting stories are running rampant. They say that vacationers haunt the place. Um, there's reports of a gardener who committed suicide that still haunts the place. A lot of the residents who lived there when it was an insane asylum. Also, there's a story about a piano that likes to play on its own. It, when it was originally constructed, the piano was formerly owned by Robert E. Lee's wife. And it is said even to this day that it will still play itself up on the third floor. People hear screaming and crying. Um, an owner at one point, her name was Donna Patty, and her caretaker, Richard Owens, they were in the hospital surgery room and the rocking chairs were all moving on their own. And so Donna Patty, her and her husband owned the property in the 70s uh, when it was the restaurant and nightclub, and they lived on the second floor of the building at the time. Hot Lake Hotel is getting this very haunting reputation to where it was even featured on the ABC documentary series, The Scariest Place on Earth, in 2001. I didn't watch that. I should have. I apologize. So in 2003 was when the building was at its absolute worst, and it was purchased by a man named David Manuel. Rest restoration of the place started as soon as he bought it, and it was so, it was in such ruins that it took a lot of time, a lot of money to get this going. They said that with, uh, there were 368 windows broken and or missing. And um, a part of the roof was missing also. <laughs> so it took two years of construction to get this back open to the public. And it was about 2005 and they were giving tours. And that was while the guest rooms were still being renovated. So you couldn't stay there, but you could walk around and get a tour of it. And sadly, like it makes you think of, is this place cursed or is the hauntings? But in 2008, the west wing of the building completely collapsed. And that part of the building was the bed and breakfast. And it had, you know, guest rooms, it had a spa, a restaurant, and a museum. Just devastating. But it is all taken care of now. It is open today. You can stay there. And it looks like a really cool place, especially kind of where it's situated. It's big. It's got its own vibe. Like, it looks pretty cool. So let's kind of get into some of the hauntings here. So it was questioned on one of the websites that I read had anyone died in the lake. So there's not a lot of historic information other than what we just said. And, and like a lot of the owners, they never said anything. Like it was an, a question they really never wanted to answer. But there's a article in 1911 that described the fall and scalding of one of the workmen who fell into the 200 degree lake and um, died um, right after. There was also another article from 1905 about a La Grande baseball player walking home from a treatment at the hot lake um, and he was struck and killed by a passing train. There's not rumors of a ghost baseball player that haunt the place, but you never know. Like he could be nearby. He, who knows, you know. So the, the new owners, they're not a part of the whole ghost hunting crowd. They're not catering to that crowd. The water is the biggest deal there and that's what they really focus on and wanted upgrades to the lodge and the soaking tubs. That is their main attraction. 
bringing in guests and highlighting the springs like it did when uh, it was first built. So here was a host on Larry King Live. It just says a host on Larry King Live um, who had spoke about the Hot Lake Hotel. And this is what they said. Quote, when we were kids, we used to tell ghost stories, but as we've gotten older, I have a friend who is a scientific researcher, and I asked them questions. My mother passed on. I chose to think she's in a wonderful other place that we all go to, but I think that some people are trapped here. These places are the places that people have talked about for years and years, that they go in and you physically feel something wrong. Some people do see things, whether it's in a mind we don't know. And and that's what I get from it. I I watched this video on YouTube. I actually referenced this video in my last episode, um, uh, The Whispers Estate in Indiana, and I apologize. It was not correct, the one with all the orbs. It was actually the Hot Lake Hotel. So, um, but like in the beginning of the video, he's like driving up and it's very ominous, very like, it's white. It's not scary looking, but it's very big. And you, when he was walking through it, and I was like, hmm, this is like, got, it's got a weird thing going on for me. If that makes any sense whatsoever. Other reports um, are said they hear screaming, crying, and a lot of dark figures just running everywhere. And... A lot of that is associated with the hospital wing, but even in like the surgery rooms, they said they smell feces and iron. Interesting. They'll also see blood appearing on the walls. Chairs will move on their own and they can see things like slithering under the water in the ponds. Again, could be just an animal, but that's, it's creepy. Um, there was an article in 2019 and I wanted to kind of, I, I shortened it, but I wanted to read what she wrote word for word because I really liked how she said it. So it's by Megan Wells. It's um, titled From Healing to Haunted, A Look Inside Oregon's Mysterious and Desolate Hot Lake Springs Hotel. So it says, quote, as I drive down the rural desolate road that leads to the Hot Lake Springs Hotel in La Grande, Oregon, my car whips back and forth from unusually high and unobscured winds. I'm buzzing with energy knowing that I'm about to spend a night alone in a hotel that was featured in a 2001 episode of The Scariest Places on Earth. Afraid I'd miss a turn at some point, I'm amazed when the Colonial Revival Hotel looms into view seemingly out of nowhere. The grandiose gates that encompasses the three-story building's stately brick facade and giant white columns feel intimidating as if I'm entering a private residence that I haven't exactly been invited to. The building itself commands so much my attention that I nearly overlook the nearby eight-acre hot lake, which is endowed by the underground springs bubbling up a half a million gallons of water every day. The average temperature of the lake is a toasty 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Brisk winds carry steam off the lake and the thick scent of sulfur adds to the ominous mood as I pull luggage from my car. I suddenly notice how eerily empty the parking lot is. So she's going by herself. The innkeep is quite surprised I've made a reservation to stay on the property alone and warns me that due to heavy winds, she plans to lock the front gates. They will not be accepting any other guests. As it turns out, I'm only one of only a handful of people who are staying the night. I'm led into the hotel's theater, a small, dark room located on the first floor equipped with church pews and a pull-down screen. Visitors are invited to sit and watch an introductory DVD, which plays a constant loop and tells the history of the, pro of the property and its owners, Lee and David Manuel. Accounts from guests who claim they've had supernatural experiences at Hot Lake Springs are notably missing from the hotel's welcome video, but former guests have reported seeing the ghosts and hearing the screams of the hospital's former patients. Some say the hotel is haunted by an old gardener who died of suicide on the property, and others claim to hear a piano located on the second floor playing on its own. I cut out a lot of the history because we had already gone over it, so this, just you know. 
Uh, she continues, quote, whether you believe in supernatural activity or not, I can report that staying overnight virtually alone in a hundred thousand square foot property in a desolate part of Oregon is creepy, to say the least. During my stay, I have completed I have complete access to almost every room in the building without fear of disturbing any living beings, and I take full advantage of this freedom. Each room is outfitted with a diary for guests to share their experiences at the hotel. And like last week's episode, very, very similar. Uh, she also says, quote, while many guests claim to have had supernatural experiences, others aren't entirely sold on the presence of ghostly spirits. I, quote, I spoke to the spirits here, one Suzanne Brooks writes. One tells me why he lingers the earth and who killed him. If I could tell someone, it would change history. The next stop on my self-guided self tour is the third floor, which includes guest quarters and a museum that showcases antique hospital equipment from the building's notorious sanatorium days. Signs on the wall leading up to the third floor warns guests to keep your voices low and sweet. I fall asleep, but at 3.22 a.m. I'm startled awake because my bed is shaking. Is it the spirits of the hot springs lake or just a train passing by the property? Regardless, the disruption spooks me enough that I never fall back asleep. Lee, the owner, joins me for breakfast. As a devout Christian, she says she has no interest in discussing the hotel's supernatural reputation because it conflicts with her beliefs. In fact, the manual stopped responding to incoming Facebook mes messages altogether when the notifications became too overwhelming. The majority of the people were writing to either report or inquire about paranormal activity on the property. Lee says, quote, it was impossible for us to keep up with the responses. So that's the end of her article, but it all makes sense. When I first started doing the research, I'm like, God, nobody's been there. Even on YouTube, you just don't find very much that they... If you want to do stuff like that, you have to be very, I guess, under the radar. They just sounds like they really don't tolerate it um so it's like well no wonder zach hasn't been there or ghost hunters or all these other shows that are out there you know so it's pretty crazy to think about that kind of finishes up hot lake hotel so you know it has been so many different things it has extreme hauntings in it you know from a, a hotel to a hospital to a sanitarium uh you can really assume that a lot of people have died on this premises, you know? Um, and, and there's tons of witnesses that are sh saying, you know, it's haunted. I'm being haunted and hearing things and seeing things that shouldn't be there just everywhere. You know, apparitions walking the ground, strange voices, whispering footsteps. And it, there's reported that one apparition in particular, in particularly that is reported to be the ghost of a man who was the gardener there who ended up committing suicide. He he is stuck there, which is insane. Like I said earlier, the YouTube video that I talked about in the last episode for Whisper Estates, it was for Hot Lake Hotel. I did not write it down correctly. I apologize. Even though Whisper's Estate is very haunted and there are a lot of orbs in a lot of the pictures. Um, this one in particular, uh, he went and I'll explain. Okay. So it's by a YouTuber. His name is Hall Z, H A L L Z E E. If you, you guys probably remember this from the last episode, and I'm so sorry. So uh, he says he goes in the beginning of the video, he's driving to it, he's walking inside. And then I think he goes straight to his room. But uh, it says in there that five minutes in, they're on the, s the secondary door of their room. So a lot of these older rooms, they have like two entrances and stuff. Um, it shook violently as if someone was trying to get in. And he ran very quickly out the main door to look down the hallway and no one was there. And he was like really sad because his camera hadn't been rolling. So he takes a ton of photos not a ton of video but that's okay because it's like he takes one photo 
and you see an orb and you're like, oh my gosh. Then he takes another photo and there's like 50 orbs in there, all different sizes. It's crazy. But, and then he takes another one and it's like one or two orbs. So he's taking them in succession and they're coming in and out. It's, it's pretty crazy. I definitely think you guys should check out um, his video just to see the pictures that he does. And he's going from room to room. There was one room that the picture was very oddly exposed. Like you look at it and you're like, is it a person? Is it some like, it's really kind of crazy to look at. And um, when he's in one of the bedrooms, he gets a pst sound just sound like especially if you hear it like as a whisper in your ear um again more and more photos and more orbs just ton of them in all these different rooms and in one um his camera goes unfocused for no reason and then focuses again his millimeter he has a millimeter going off and it's going crazy he did stay there but a lot of what I took from it is just the amount of orbs that were... I I believe in orbs. I definitely think I can tell the difference between bugs and dust. And it's just insane when they're taking pictures of like their dog just sitting in their room. It's like, how does he not notice what's going on? And, and other people in the rooms. And it, it's pretty crazy. I definitely think you guys should go check out the video. Um, but yeah, sadly... Zachy baby hasn't been there and it, uh, I don't know if they'll ever let him go but yeah that is the end of Hot Lake Hotel in La Grande Oregon hope you guys enjoyed that one join me again on February 13th which means it's a new bonus dark tale and I haven't picked one out yet but I have a lot in mind and they're so creepy I'm excited for him. Um, and then our next new episode will be on the 15th. We are going to Iowa. One I'm very excited about. I've been very intrigued by this one for a very long time. So I'm glad to finally be able to cover it. If you guys want to follow me, I have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. And if you'd like to help support the show... I would love to get like stickers going again. Yeah, we'll see. Because I like to give them out. It's not like I'm going to buy a bunch of stickers and then sell them for a dollar. or so. I don't know. Um, I, I want them to be just gifts I can give out. Anyways, yes. And if you guys could go on to Apple Podcasts to Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts, and please rate and review, I would love you forever and ever even though I already do you know I should probably stop talking thank you guys for joining me on this beautiful Wednesday and I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your week bye guys (laughs) 